Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you're watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining our conversation with Sylvia Moreno Garcia in partnership with KERA in Texas and the Texas Center for the Book. Since 2015, PBS Books has worked to share with audiences across the country the voices of dynamic authors as they attended our nation's top book festivals. This year, PBS Books is proud to partner with the Library of Congress in sharing the National Book Festival with audiences across the country as we promote their festival and our PBS broadcast. Tonight's conversation is part of this important series. Before we begin, we would like to, to thank our Library Network partners, PBS stations around the country for sharing this important conversation with you. But most importantly, we'd like to thank viewers like you for joining us. Today's conversation celebrates trailblazing writer Sylvia Moreno Garcia, exploring her writing and her recently re released book, Velvet Was the Night. Sylvia will be featured in the National Book Festival themed Open a Book, Open the World, and is also part of the one hour PBS documentary featuring 16 authors. Let's take a moment and watch this, the trailer. Hi everybody, I'm LeVar Burton and this is Open a Book, Open the World, the Library of Congress National Book Festival. When I try and create a work, work of fiction, one of my big aims is to create an entire world. And I think that kind of fictional world and how see, we, we see characters express their thoughts and feelings, that for me is opening up the world. I believe that narrative nonfiction is the closest that many of us will ever get to being another person. And that sense of empathy is good for anybody, but it's also particularly important, I think, for writers, because that's one of our most important tools is the capacity for empathy. I think uh, there's many places that I met for the very first time through a book. For me, books were a way of learning about the world and experiencing things I had never experienced before. Books have always just shown me just how big and how small the world is. A good book can take you on a journey. And after the last year, we are all ready to plot a new course and books can be an amazing compass. An addiction to reading has been a key secret of my success. It was literature that opened up so many pathways, so many possibilities for me. I read books so I could discover new worlds in those books. I, I have books that are in it. I don't even think of like, like this room, I don't think of having books in, but I have like 50, 60 books in this room. It's enlarging your horizon. It's your, books are everything. It gives me more of a complex understanding of humanity, which I think is the power of stories, that we are able to see ourselves in all manner of different character. And that, I think, is what I enjoy from a great book. Join me as some of our nation's leading literary voices bring us a sense of renewal, discuss their newest work, and open up a whole new world of possibilities. Welcome back. The PBS Library of Congress Open a Book, Open the World special premieres at 6 p.m. on Sunday, September 12th for KERA and many PBS stations across the country. But check your local listing. The Library of Congress National Book Festival launches on September 17th and runs through the 26th. For more information, go to www.loc dot gov slash book fest. So now the moment you've been waiting for. It is my extraordinary pleasure to introduce New York Times bestselling author Sylvia Moreno Garcia. She is the author of the critically acclaimed novels Velvet Was the Night, Mexican Gothic, Gods of Jade and Shadow, Signal to Noise, Certain Dark Things and, Be and the Beautiful Ones and more. She also has edited several anthologies. She currently lives in Vancouver, British Columbia. Welcome, Sylvia. Hello. Hello, everyone. 
Sylvia, it's so great to have you here. Thanks for being here. Thank so, you. Thank you. <laughs> so tonight's conversation will be guided by KERA reporter Alejandra Martinez, who is also a reporter for the Texas Newsroom through Report for America. Alejandra is committed to ensure that the voices of under-resourced communities are heard in Dallas, Texas, and beyond. Before joining KERA, Alejandra was a producer at WLRN South Florida's NPR, KUT Austin, Austin's NPR, where she covered immigration, marginalized communities, and the local art scene. Welcome, Alejandra. We're thrilled to have you. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Before I hand the reins over to you, I just want to do a quick reminder to all of our audience members out there. If you have a question for Sylvia, please put it in the chat. At the end of the conversation, we, of course, start asking all of your juicy questions. So uh, keep them coming our way, and we will ask them at the end. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone to this conversation. I am excited to be joined by Silvia Moreno Garcia. Um, I um, am a reader of hers. I have read Mexican Gothic and I have read part of Bilbo was the Night. And I'm so excited to talk to you, Silvia. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Um, sometimes a helicopter goes by, so, you know, we might have that or sound of a cat trying to get in, but I hope we're all good with that. Yeah, we're definitely good with that. I have a cat of my own. If she jumps on my lap during this conversation, I hope we understand. Um, well, Sylvia, I wanted to start with the Library of Congress themes for this year's National Book Festival. Open a book, open the world. And I wanted to hear from you, how did books play a role in your life growing up? Oh, yeah. Well, um, I grew up in Mexico, all around the place. Um, I was born in the north um, in California, and then we moved all over the place. And, um, well, you know, sometimes uh, things were not very nice <laughs> around my house. And economically, we didn't have many possibilities at certain points uh, because, you know, things went up and down. My parents worked in radio and radio journalism is not a profession full of stability and cash. I'll tell you that. So um, sometimes when things were bad, I would like to take a book and kind of escape into it and see other places, other people that I would never be able to meet on my own. That is how I learned about anything from what uh, 19th century France was like to what people ate in New York City. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that experience about, you know, books being an anchor kind of to finding these new worlds. The public library was definitely a place that was very special to me growing up. Um, and, you know, I love your books because it makes me feel at home. It makes me feel in Mexico. And all of your books have, you know, they're set in Mexico. And I know you mentioned growing up there. And I wanted to hear from you, like, what are your favorite memories of growing up in Mexico? Oh, well, definitely the food, <laughs> you know, I have a, I have a really big appetite and um, I like all the food. Um, one of the problems in Vancouver is that it, there's not as much Mexican food of, as I would want to. And before COVID, when the border was open, you know, we would go over to um, like the States and, and go to Seattle to find a lot of Mexicans cooking and, and go over there. But yeah, I love the food. I love the colors, the sounds of the, uh, of the country. It's a very big nation and very different. I think one of the problems is that when it's seen from the outside, a lot of things are flattened and you don't get all those gradients of uh, just how wildly, just geographically, how the country can be so different. Where I was born in the north in Baja is very different from the central part and it's very different from the south. It's very different from Chiapas and Yucatan and just the beauty of, of the nature of it and of the people, it's just great. And yes, of course, like I said, the food. I miss eating pancita and I miss eating a lot of things. And um, I am eager to both go back to visit friends in the States and family and go back to Mexico to just go to San Cosme and just have tacos. 
Oh yeah, oh my God. I don't think I would be able to go without a mole or pozole. My mom's homemade mole is one of my favorite things. And I feel like I would be very homesick if I wasn't gonna be able to eat that for a very long time. Um, but a lot, you know, I, I've i read your work and I, I, I feel like, you know, authors drive from experience and memories and I wanted you know how did your memories and experiences help shape your writing or help you shape yourself as an author mm -hmm. well one of the reasons why I write is because of my great-grandmother who um, she grew up during the time of the Mexican Revolution and she told me a lot of stories about what it was like growing up in that time and she was illiterate so she couldn't read or write so she would just speak to me and tell me the stories in that way. But I think that was a really formative experience for me, learning the role of narrative and that narrative is not just something that is written down, it's also something that is told. Yeah, and you know, I wanted to get a little bit into your book and how much can you tell us without, you know, revealing too much about your latest book, Velvet Was the Night, because it is set in Mexico, right? Yep. Yes, it's uh, set in, against, it's a noir and it's two different characters who are on the hunt for a woman who has, might have compromising photographs. And this book opens with a real incident in 1971 in June, um, basically a paramilitary, paramilitary group trained by the CIA and backed by the Mexican government attacked a group of students that were protesting in downtown Mexico City and killed and injured a bunch of them. And this was called the Alconazo. This incident is what begins the novel and what we have after is this noir where these, these two characters trying to find this compromising information, but it's all set in a real time period against a certain, a very specific political and cultural background. Yeah, so you tell us about, you know, it's set in the 1970s and it dives into the political climate of Mexico at the time. Yeah. Um, for those who aren't really familiar with that history, um, um, tell us a little bit about what is happening in Mexico during the 1970s. Yes, yeah, so what happens is this begins a little bit earlier, but in the 1960s, uh, there began to be clashes between the government and student activists. Activists wanted more freedom of expression, rights for women, uh, that autonomy for universities, that kind of stuff. The government, which was ruled by the PRI, the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, which, which was a central ruling party and had been for decades, uh, did not like this kind of activism, the, the things that the students were doing. In 1968, Mexico was hosting the Olympics. And the Mexican government was very worried about the image that they were sending out into the world. They didn't want photographers to take pictures of students that were protesting abuses against human rights or anything like that. So there was a, another, there was a march that happened. Students were marching, uh, complaining about, you know, issues with the government and the government deployed um, tanks and soldiers and killed a bunch of people in 1968. After that, they decided that it was a bad idea to directly intervene with soldiers. They were going to fund and train a group of covert operatives called the Hawks, Los Halcones, with the help of the CIA. And they would send those people to basically torture, kill, spy on, and intervene against student groups. So in 1971, what we have is this another major clash where, like I said, people die. This is the front page of La Prensa in 1968. And this is what the government said was what's happening. Foreign terrorists. They accused students of being uh, terrorists, anarchists, of starting this violence, when in reality, they were sending out people to murder students. There's a hawk with a rifle. And when this picture came out in one of the few newspapers, one of two newspapers that didn't follow the official line and didn't have, didn't say that the hawks were imaginary or that it was students terrorists. The photographer who picked this one, Ricardo Salgado, was tortured, beaten, and black and blackballed. So he never was able to work again. 
So that's what was happening in Mexico in the 1970s. It was a climate of terror and of oppression orchestrated by the president and the ruling party. Silvia, muchas gracias for telling us this history. I feel like, you know, this, this is a very complex and not often talked about history. And based on what you kind of shared with us, there is a lot of research um, that I feel like you've done um, to kind of encapsulate and put that into the book because in the book you are set right away in that scene that you're describing one of those protests um what is your you know why did you choose specifically this time period to to be the setting of this book i think 1968 is better known in mexico as this kind of turning point there's more certainly more literature about it in terms of fiction. 1971 is less used for fiction. And so I wanted to mine it because I felt it hadn't been used that much. And I wanted to use a noir because I thought it was the perfect genre to encapsulate this kind of story. It's just um, a story that is a lot about characters, uh, but it's also a lot about the environment that they are in. And so I thought it would be very evocative. Um, and it was just a place, that, you know, a time that I hadn't explored before. I'm, I'm all about going through the decades and seeing what I can find. Yeah, you mentioned specifically that this is a noir and not a, not a thriller. No. Um, can you kind of identify or tell us the differences between the two genres? Because I think they often get put into the same category. Yeah, they do get confused. And so basically, um, when you're talking about a mystery, there's um, it's, you know, it's a whodunit. It's like the Sherlock Holmes kind of thing. Who killed Colonel Mustard in the kitchen with the candlestick sort of situation. That's a mystery and it's part of the crime family. And then you have thrillers and thrillers tend to have higher stakes. The bomb is going to go off somewhere in the White House and the president is in danger. And then you have kind of the noir, which as Nino Frank says, which is my favorite definition of the noir, is that they are essentially psychological narratives with the action, however violent or fast paced, less significant than the faces, gestures, words, than the truth of the characters. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that, uh, one of my favorite noirs is The Postman Always Rings Twice. So that's not a book where it's a whodunit. We're not wondering, okay, who killed the husband in, in this story, spoiler. Um, and it's not a thriller because there's no high stakes. It's just some damaged and dark people doing something very bad and now it's getting really close to it and seeing what's going on. I think it really, the noir really puts people under the microscope. Yeah, and you mentioned that it focused very much on its characters and very character driven. Um, where did your inspiration for the main characters of this book come from? I wanted to contrast two very different people that seem to be orbiting around each other or without really touching and who also seem to be coming from opposite poles yet have something in common. So Maite, uh, who is a secretary, an ordinary secretary, uh, living a bland life, is a lover of romance comic books. And she kind of escapes into that and into music. She wants to imagine um, a world where every where she's a glamorous woman and she has all these handsome lovers, which is not happening. And then we've got Elvis, who works for the Hawks, and he's an enforcer. Um, he, I think he wants to be in a James Bond kind of adventure, but that's not the hand that he's been dealt with. So you have these two people who are kind of inhabiting fantasy spaces that are clashing with the reality that they are living in. It's not a very glamorous or very exciting or very fun reality. Yeah, I saw that, you know, another thing, like today on Instagram, I saw that you posted a question with the photo of your book kind of asking, what is in the name? And I think you're referring also to the like bilingualism in the book, the Spanish and English um, kind of sprinkled throughout it. How does, you know, cause uh, how does, you know, being bilingual, um, you know, speaking both languages shape or influence the way you craft your stories? 
It's always a hard and funny dance to be writing in English about something that happened in Mexico, but that's just the way it is. Um, and I don't like to um, do a Spanish word stew, like I call it, which is every other word is in Spanish. I ate the tortilla con un poco de mole, and then I sat on the silla, and I looked at the atardecer, you know? Like, I don't think that works very well. I try to translate most of the terms that I can translate, but there are some things that are simply untranslatable. Uh, so, you know, if I want to say porro, it has to be porro. There's no other word for it. I, you know, I tried to come up with other terms. It just didn't work. It's just the way it is. Um, so there's some of that. And then there's also um, playing with trying to give you an impression of what speaking um, in, in as a Spanish speaker would be like. So the way I handle that in Velvet Was the Night is that um, El Mago, who is a character who's supposed to be higher class and more educated, in Velvet Was the Night, he never speaks in contractions because I'm trying to give you the sense of what we would call um, tutear versus ustedes versus vosotros, the more formal way of speaking when you say como esta usted, versus the more colloquial, como estás tú? And I couldn't reproduce that exactly the same because English and Spanish don't have those particularities. But by not using contractions in that kind of speech, I tried to make it more formal, more posh, and give you the idea, therefore, that you're listening on the one hand from somebody who is coming from an upper class kind of environment. And then you've got Elvis who has a background. He's from Tepito. So he's not speaking in the same way as this other character. So you should be able to kind of hear them without necessarily me transcribing every single word into Spanish. Yeah, I, I definitely see that the, the use of, you know, the language to identify not only, you know, where these characters are in the social class level, but also what their role is in the story. Um, you spoke about your longing for home, missing, you know, you individually missing home, missing the food. Um, as an author now living away from the place you grew up in and, you know, that you lived for a number, uh, you know, for a long time, this writing about home, um, you know, in Mexican Gothic or in Velvet Was the Night, um, renew its personal significance to you and, you know, bring it back up? Like, is it a way to relive the moments that you've lived? Um. I don't think consciously it is. I'm not necessarily trying to time travel back to a certain time period, but obviously when you're writing about something like this, I, you know, I, I talked to my father about some of the music of the time. Um, I talked to my mother who was around when the Alconazo happened and about what it was like uh, to be out in the streets and suddenly hear all the gunfire and be afraid that you were going to die right that moment. And so in that way, it allows me to excavate the past, but it's not necessarily that I want to return to something. It's just, uh, it just happens as part of the process. Yeah, and I wanted to ask a little bit more about your, your researching process. Um, I guess you identified this time and you wanted to really set your characters there, but how much research really did you have to do to make sure that, you know, all the references that you mentioned in the book um, seem as accurate as possible? Yeah, it's it's as accurate as it can be, I hope, uh, within the constraints of fiction. I mean, I'm, I'm deploying fictional characters into, into a real framework, but there are, people that are being mentioned who are real, uh, places that are being mentioned that really existed, things that were really happening. Um, and so I try to be as truthful to my my reality as I can. Uh, that sounds uh, strange when you're talking about fiction. But for example, this is not a book in which, like, like a movie like Inglorious Bastards, Hitler is going to be killed in a movie theater and machine gun and and blown to bits because I, I tried to stay true to the spirit of the time period in, in that sense and to the reality that, um, you know, spoiler, the president, Luis Echeverria, is alive and well right now. He got his COVID vaccine in April, which I, I, I told somebody it was like watching Darth Vader get his COVID vaccine. It's just like evil just lives on. <laughs> and, uh, 
comics play a role in this book, right? Like how so? Um, there are references, correct? Yes, there's, um, well, Maite is a really big fan of romance comic books, which were a thing. Uh, nowadays we associate superheroes with comic books and we don't realize about the kind of vast richness that there was of comic books in the United States and in Mexico. Uh, but there were a lot of romance comic books. I'll show you one. And she just reads that and I'll show you an American one. So oh. this is her diary. And I really oh. like the cover. So that's what they look like. Um, Mike, they reads those and she reads the Spanish ones, obviously, which were a little bit different. Those were like soap operas in long form. Um, and it really, what I wanted to do there was to contrast a different kind of pulp fiction, which is a romance pulp fiction with the noir and make them kind of clash head on with each other. So she's living in this or wants to live in this fantasy romantic world, but voila, she happens to fall into a noir, which is another type of pulp fiction product that you would have seen around that time period. Yeah, one of the first things is Maita running to get her little comic book. Um, uh, growing up, I I was a fan of the Archie comics. Um, yeah. What what were your favorite comics if you read some? Um, scary ones, horror ones. So yeah, around around that time, and some of the funny ones uh, like La Familia Burrón, which was a Mexican comic book. But I did read Betty and Veronica. My father bought bought that for me, but I prefer the ones that were kind of like Tales from the Crypt sort of sort of comic books. Were you always into horror and thrillers? Um, you mentioned the comics that you used to get and those are those were horror you said. Oh yeah, definitely. Since I was a small child, I remember going to see aliens in the movie theater. We went to see aliens in the movie theater in where we lived in Baja California because the air conditioning malfunctioned at our home and it was so hot that we had to go something to somewhere to cool down. The only place open at that time in town was a movie theater and there were no multiplexes back in that day. It was just one, you know, one room, one big room. And the only movie playing was Alien. So my mother just told me the monsters are not real and there's air conditioning, so let's go. So she kind of started that, you know, it was her fault. That was four or five years old, something like that. We um, actually got a question from um, one of our um, viewers about um, there is like subtle moments of comedy or there was like comedic moments um, throughout the book. And they were asking if you um, did that, um, was like, was that, was that intentional? Were you trying to find, you know, I guess, some kind of relief in this noir. It, it's funny, but um, spying is a lot more boring than people think and a lot more mundane. And I wanted to get some of the kind of mundaneness of, of this kind of situation. I, I had a friend who worked as a private detective and he reads a lot of books and he told me he read so many books because there was nothing to do except you know sit in a car and read paperbacks you know so he went through them like like everything and it's the same kind of thing in this time period um capping wires listening to conversations tailing somebody is really very kind of dull in a way and there's a certain kind of um mundane and bureaucr bureaucracy built into this and so you find things like um you know for real, like somebody beating somebody, an activist, and they're basically telling the other person, so what are we gonna have for lunch after? And I think that is kind of funny and ironic. It's also horrific because it means that, uh, you know, state violence is almost pure. Yeah, we have a couple questions coming in and I just wanna remind our um, viewers who are tuning in or um, that we are celebrating the Library of Congress National Book Festival and I am joined here with Silvia Moreno Garcia, author of the latest, her latest book is called Velvet Was the Night. Um, my name is Alejandra Martinez, I'm a reporter with KERA and this is a joint event with PBS Books. Um, we are talking to her about her latest book, like I said, Velvet Was the Night and I encourage everyone to submit any questions they might have for Silvia about her this book, her past book, Mexican Gothic, or just any questions you might have about um, the significance of books or what um, she has coming up. Um, and we got a question from one 
person kind of asking, will there be a telenovela kind of book where we might find out if Maite and Elvis end up together? <laughs> No, unfortunately, I don't write sequels or series. I'm sorry. I get really bored with one thing and jump into the other. So I'm already, a, yeah. And, and the thing is, you watch books in slow motion. But this was written like a few years ago, and it's just coming out now. So by now, I'm already working on a totally different thing. No, we are never going to find out, I guess. Or maybe you can tell us. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I. You know, now that I mentioned Elvis, um, um, did music, you know, if there was a soundtrack for this book, um, what is a song that would be part of this playlist or mixtape? Oh, I actually did do a playlist. Uh, if you go to my website, you can find it. It's on Spotify and it has a bunch of the music that is mentioned from the, from the time period. I should say that, um, one of the really interesting things that is happening, aside from the political aspects of, of what is going on in Mexico, is the music. There's censorship of music, and there's also this kind of growing rock movement in Mexico. In the beginning, everything is cover songs from the Americans. So they're basically translating songs into Spanish. And so, and sometimes they're not very good. The lyrics don't make sense. Uh, you know, how you translate them. I want to hold your hand into Spanish is not very artistic at times. And then you get this weird time period in Mexico, very brief, uh, where you start getting kind of psychedelic rock music and emerging rock music, but it's happening in English. And I think some people would be like, why are these people singing in English? But it's because a lot of the bands that are importing this sound are coming from the north of the country. They're coming from Tijuana, where they're listening to rock music, where they're listening to a different kind of sound. And they're bringing it to other parts of Mexico. And you're getting some really interesting kind of songs and pieces that most people don't know about that sound not like nothing else um, from the time. And so it's just, it's an exciting moment musically and a brief moment musically. And I, I like it because there's like a, kind of irony in it. Sometimes when people look at Mexico, they have this image of what Mexico should be, you know, in terms of, you know, it's exotic appeal. And they might say like, how is that Mexican? How are those people singing in English? You know, following kind of this hippie psychedelic vibe in any way Mexican, and yet they were Mexican vibes and they were working in that milieu. So it's just an interesting kind of uh, thing that makes your head spin a little bit around sometimes. Um, it goes against stereotypes. So there's a lot of really cool music anyway from the time period. Um, I include some of it in my playlist if you want to check it out. And um, and there's like just a bunch of other bands that I didn't put in the playlist, but they're also very cool and that are doing this kind of uh, bridging of two different nations and kinds of music in this era. Can you remind us one more time exactly where we can find that playlist, Sylvia? On my website, um, there's a tab or a drop down that says Velvet Was a Night, and there's like a playlist at the bottom. So, thank you. Yeah. So, as you're writing, do these songs just like pop up in your head as you're writing? I mean, maybe a certain scene, or how does, um, um, because it seems very intentional that you wanted to incorporate music in the book. Yeah, I didn't want to incorporate music in the book originally because I did another book called Signal to Noise that was a lot about music and I did not want to repeat myself. But at one point it became an inevitable choice. And when I realized that I had to include it was when I was reading um, this memoir from an activist that had been tortured and imprisoned by the government. And he's talking about a moment where people are coming in and they're about to beat him. and he remembers the music that was playing on the radio at that time. And he actually mentions in his memoir that he hates the music that they played at the time because they played very loud tropical music. It was not, I guess, his kind of thing. But when I read that, I realized that I was kind of avoiding something important. The music had to be part of it. Mm. Um, one of our um, viewers asked, are there books that you might recommend that are a good pairing to go with Velvet Was the Night? Um, I was inspired, well, one of the things that inspired this novel was a book called, I think in English it's called The Mongolian Complot uh, by a writer uh, by the last name of Bernard. 
and it's considered the very first uh, Mexican noir. And it actually came out in 1968. So it came out during this time period is when you're getting noir for the first time emerging in Latin America. And then Paco Ignacio Taibo is just a really great writer. Um, he has a lot of books like An Easy Thing, following uh, Hector Velasco Shine, who is this um, chain smoking, one eyed Mexican private detective. I believe he has red hair, if I'm not mistaken, just to show you how stereotypes don't necessarily work or what we think about truly Mexican. And um, and then I, I like more modern noirs too. Um, there's one that's called Dope, I think. And uh, let me check the name. Yeah, Sarah. Yeah, Sarah Graham. Dope. I really like it. It's about a woman who um, is, it's, it's in the 1950s, but it has that smoky noir vibe. Um, is there anything that you're reading right now that you may or maybe are like driving inspiration from? Uh, I'm doing nonfiction research right now, so I'm not in the face of reading of reading fiction. Um, I am reading about things that are very specific and very bizarre. Uh, silver nitrate preservation, <laughs> if anybody is interested, uh, is an interesting topic. But no, I'm not reading any fiction this week. As an author, you know, I'm, you have to read so much, you have to write so much. How do you balance your reading for fun and then reading for research or because of my job? Um, I like reading all kinds of weird, bizarre things just out of curiosity. So I enjoy reading books about the history of salt or things like that just for fun. But then I also write re reading long papers, even if it's just for research. I generally switch around a little bit. So like this week I'm doing a lot of research, but next week I'll probably be reading more fiction books or short stories or something else just to forget about the stuff that I was doing this week. Yeah, um, we have another question. Um, they mentioned that in Mexican Gothic, you, you know, you put forefront and you talk a lot about race and class. How do you use your writing? as a tool to talk about those things and kind of dig into them? Well, um, I'm not a sociopolitical <laughs> expert, so I just talk about the things that I find interesting. Um, you know, things about what is the class structure in Mexico or what it was like when I was growing up, what are some racial issues or discrimination issues that uh, I saw in the environment or that I continue to see. But I'm not necessarily, I think, uh, an academician who, who can solve many of the pressing questions in a more elaborate way. Was there, you know, through your creating process, creative writing process, um, um, how do you get through difficult, maybe chapters that are harder to read, to, to I mean, to write? Um, what kind of advice can you offer maybe aspiring writers um, that might feel stuck kind of in certain parts of their book? Um, I just write through it. I'm a very linear writer, so I don't necessarily like write a chapter that's at the end of the beginning. I just go from beginning to end, just sprint through it. And then it generally, if there's any problems with it, I'll solve them when I come back to for a second pass, but yeah, I, I just write through it. I, I don't believe in being too precious about the work. Writing is freelancing. You, um, I have a background in journalism, I studied, um, I work in communications. So there's no such thing as telling your boss that you won't have the copy ready at 5 p.m., as you probably know. So I just push through it and I do it. Um, I don't write every day. I do other things sometimes during the week, uh, things as mundane as shredding papers like I was doing earlier. And um, and so I maybe write a couple of days a week, but when I do write, I sit down and it's like, all right, let's go. We're gonna write for a couple of hours. Is there anything that you are actively, I know you like uh, actively working on right now that maybe you would like to share with people who are watching right now? Well, my next book is called The Daughter of Dr. Moreau and we're going through, mm -hmm, I think first, proof pages uh, next month. So it's basically being put into a book form. So that'll be out next year. It's been written. We're just, you know, playing with the commas and the periods and that kind of stuff.
Yeah, I feel like, you know, this came out this year, Mexican Gothic, the year before, and you're working on another book. Um, do you feel at the moment just very inspired and these stories are coming to you? Um, what keeps you motivated with your work? Money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll be, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I think it's crass to say that sometimes when you're talking about literature, you're supposed to pretend that you live off the nectar of flowers and uh, and uh, soft bubbles. But I, I mean, I have a day job, uh, but I do, with the way things have happened lately and co with COVID, let's just say that I am responsible for more people now than I ever was before financially. Um, and um, and so I got to pay for stuff like toothpaste and uh, toilet paper. And so this uh, this writing income helps help pay that. And braces, braces are really expensive. I think, you know, kids should be born without teeth uh, because, yeah. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's 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 not like, uh, you know, money is the only driver for my writing because I was writing when I was making literally, uh, you know, like two bucks in in royalties or not even that but it's it's definitely a consideration to hitting your deadlines um and um not thinking that i am the greatest thing since sliced bread i just think i'm one more writer uh writing books and uh, trying to have a good time while doing it and not getting too caught up in distractions um uh, that just you know would bleed away my time essentially um but yeah um, you know, it's it's a freelancer's life. Life is what writing is, and so when you're a freelancer, you have to have a lot of balls in the air, and uh, you have to really be kind of chasing chasing the next paycheck that's going to keep you afloat. Yeah, I definitely appreciate your honesty, and I mean, as a reader of yours, just keep them coming, keep the books coming, because I will read anything that has your name. But, you know, I think it also you offer really good advice for people who are maybe per wanting to pursue a, a, a career as being a writer or an author. Um, I mean, you yourself have experimented with uh, or have written also books in like a lot of different genres. Um, uh, is that like something that you are wanting to challenge yourself to explore all these different genres or um, um, or is that something that has just came throughout with your characters? Yes, it's it's part of it is that I want to challenge myself and, it, and it's part of the fun of it. Um, writing is not an elevator. It's not a swift climb through the top. It's more like snakes and ladders. You go up, you go down, you'll, you know, you don't know what's going to happen, what roll of the dice you're going to get next time. But part of keeping that fun is that you have to find a reason for doing it that goes beyond, yes, the money and the adulation and the praise and all that kind of stuff. And and for me, one one part of that is just challenging me to do something new, different, or trying to see if I can get there in, in, term, in terms of story. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation, conversation Sylvia. Um, uh, Sylvia Moreno Garcia is the author of Velvet Was the Night. Um, we are here celebrating the Library of Congress National Book Festival with PBS Books and KERA. Um, we're gonna go now to Rebecca Manley, who is gonna guide us throughout the rest of the night. Uh, well, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, my connection to the National Book Festival is I run the Texas Center for the Book. And there's a center for the book in every state um, and this, under the Center for the Book National um, with the Library of Congress. So we're kind of the boots on the ground of the Library of Congress in each state. And, you know, Sylvia, without, you know, taking anything away from the National Book Festival or any spoilers for September, can you tell us what you're looking forward to with that event, please. Oh my God. Um, you know what? It's just been a really weird kind of year and a half because the pandemic was really, I mean, bad for many reasons, including, you know, mental health for a lot of people and all that kind of stuff. But in some ways it has been really good for me because I've been doing a lot of online events and, events that I wouldn't have done before. And I've gotten to meet a lot of people I would not have met before. And that's really cool. Um, I hope that going forward, we keep some of this virtual events going on. There are people who can 
not attend uh, conferences or go to New York City or go to these other places so easily. Sometimes there are issues of people who have different abilities. I know sometimes my, you know, I have a friend who always says that whenever she goes to a venue, there's just like no wheelchair access. And so having these kinds of online experiences I, are just very enriching and enjoy each and every one of them. And I just love talking to people I've never <laughs> met before and answering um, answering funny questions from, from the audience. Sometimes they get very creative, which is it's good to see what challenging question they have. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're so funny. I'm still laughing on living off the nectar flowers comment. <laughs> um, so when, when we're talking about opening books to the world, I'm just curious because we're with libraries, how do you see libraries opening the world to readers? Oh, well, free books, right? You know, that's just really, really kind of cool. But it's not just free books. It's it's also all the other stuff that librarians do from building collections. Books don't just appear in a library space by themselves or something who's curating them and letting you kind of walk through this room, experiencing the world in a certain way. So they build collections, they give, um, you know, advice. You can go to a librarian and ask them, uh, what do you think about this thing? And they won't look weirdly at you like other people will in my experience in, in the world, you know, but you go to a librarian and you tell them, um, you know, I really like Sherlock Holmes and they don't think you're a weirdo. They direct you to to a wonderful new pasture of, of titles. Um, they do things like uh, organizing events where you can meet writers uh, in the community, workshops, all this kind of stuff. So it's, it's a very kind of um, idyllic world that I th that I think libraries provide. And in Mexico, growing up, we did not have a lot of libraries. We did not have that at all. So when I saw what like American or and Canadian style libraries were were like, I was like, oh my god, they have all this stuff here, and you can just take it. It was you know, it was it was thrilling. <laughs> Oh, I totally agree with that. And you're t talking about, you know, giving books and helping to curate experiences. I love what you were saying earlier about traveling the world through reading. And what would you say to readers who don't know where to start, but they want to read their way around the world? Yeah. I mean, for example, for horror, I helped, uh, kind of curate this horror, uh, summer horror at the library. And, and sometimes like, like I can really speak about that category a lot, but uh, sometimes there are these efforts that are going up at your local library and you don't even know about them because we just kind of sometimes go through like through life on automatic, which is like, I don't have time for this. I'm just, you know, like got to get on the bus, got to check my Twitter. And then you stop and, and like, I really stop sometimes and I look at the displays at the library, just like the little pyramids they build and the posters that they make. And I'm like, wow, like, you know, it's like Asian Heritage Month and I never knew there was a book about this. And so sometimes it's just slowing down and looking at all the resources, um, asking an expert. Um, and the good thing about books is that there's so many ways to connect with readers nowadays. Uh, even, you know, joining a book club and all that kind, you don't have to do it physically, you can join it online. But I would just say to approach your local librarian next time and tell them, like, honestly, I'm not a very big reader of horror books, but I'm interested. But maybe I'm terrified of spiders or giant spiders, so not a giant spider book. They'll know how to direct you. I have a friend who's afraid of bears, and he is afraid of spiders, too. And he is most afraid of a giant spider the size of a bear coming for him one day. So I will not recommend a book with that for him ever but other things are fine. Snakes are fine, so. I think that's a great advice to make sure you let the librarian know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like, especially with things like, uh, yeah, if, if there's something specific that you don't like to see, it's better to talk to it with somebody and, and they, they can help you navigate it. You know? Yeah, well, and I feel like, especially with your book, with Mexican Gothic, it, for me, I felt like it appeal, appeals across genres. So how do you get readers to jump genres and read something out of their literary comfort zones? Oh, um, good one. Yeah, I think, yeah, that would be for the marketing people that I work with. <laughs> um, I, like, I just, you know, hmm. we are sometimes so stuck in our ways that we think that we're not going to like something and then we actually love it. So. 
For years, I avoided reading Moby Dick because I had the impression that it was a really boring, fat book. And then I started following the Moby Dick Twitter account and I became very interested in the tweets. And so I read the book and it's a really funny, um, interesting, even homoerotic book at some points with a lot of whale facts. And I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't, you know, that, that Twitter account hadn't gotten me out of my lane into a new lane. So I would tell people to um, find their Moby Dick moment <laughs> and maybe take a chance on something. You never know. Uh, but with food, I've done the same thing. I eat everything. Um, and I mean everything on the face of the earth. And although I have been disappointed by some things like the time that I ate anchovies, there have been very successful moments too. So, you know, you will get an anchovy, but you will also find delicious durian fruit. So, <laughs> devour everything. I love devour that. Devour everything. Yeah. Be omnivorous in, in your book choices. So people are wondering if there'll be um, book club kits um, for this book, like there was for American um, Mexican Gothic. Yes, there is. And if you go to my website and you click on Velvet Was a Night, you will find a link to the Random House uh, book kit material, providing more information about the time period. Great. And then we have a, another question from our great audience. Did you find it difficult to find the publishing and the English speaking book industry with books that are very Mexican, but not about an immigrant struggle. Yes, very, very difficult. Um, and not only with editors and publishers, but also sometimes with readers. I've had, you know, I, I had one person track me down, like, yeah, and basically tell me that they didn't like the names of the characters in my book. They were very weird. And flank, frankly, for me, Tiffany is one of the weirdest names that I have ever seen in my life but i say it so again have an open mind <laughs> you, you will you will live a happy life but yes it was a struggle so what is one fictional character that you'd like to hang out with for the day well my favorite fictional characters are horrible characters so i would probably be <laughs> in a lot of trouble but um yeah, I'm trying to think somebody who's not a murderer um, because I just thought about Hannibal Lecter all of a sudden. Um, I don't know, somebody nice, maybe Elizabeth Bennett. Yeah, somebody that won't kill me. Yeah, <laughs> from, from Pride and Prejudice. That's very wise, Sylvia. Uh, you're talking about how in noir you put people under the microscope and your characters are also very layered. So how do you put your characters under the microscope so they can come across authentic in your words? I think you have to accept the warts that people have. So most people are not perfectly nice or perfectly awful. They have these variations and sometimes, especially with women characters, I we judge them really harshly, uh, more harshly than others. And you have to, um, I think, write women who are sometimes vain, but or sometimes are selfish, sometimes are unkind or cruel, uh, sometimes are insecure, and sometimes are boring, and accept all of that as facets of the human experience and, and just go with it. Um, I don't like characters that are too flawless. I, I love the flaws in characters. I love the flaws in people too. Otherwise, you know, the world would be a lot boring uh, if people were perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. And do you think that that um, writing those layered imperfect characters, what do you think that does for your readers? I hope they find them, you know, realistic and they remind them of somebody that they know, or maybe even of themselves. There's a lot of me in some of my characters, but again, I am not a serial killer for people wondering about that. Uh, sometimes people ask me that, especially with Mexican Gothic. And I, don't have an ancestral secret or grow mushrooms somewhere in my house, but there are aspects of me reflected in that book. Well, thank you so much for all this amazing conversation. I feel like I could talk to you forever, um, but we are going to wrap it up. So I'd love to bring Alejandra and Heather back. And thank you for spending this time with me and for with all of us, really. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, and thank you, Alejandra, for guiding today's conversation. Most of all, we need to thank Sylvia for helping us transport us to new worlds on amazing adventures. Um, thank you for your incredible work, and thank you for your creativity, for um, 
needing to pay for braces for your kids um, and for keeping us laughing. I mean, this was such a fun conversation. I know I enjoyed the humor in it all and, and we love your vision and your dedication to bringing that to us. So thank you, Sylvia, so very much for, for your time. Um, we are at the top of the hour. And so we need to close the conversation, but we are so thankful for everyone who participated in the conversation. We're also thankful to our viewers for joining us this evening. So thank you for PBS Books, and we look forward to seeing you. Just for all of those out there who have time tomorrow, we will be speaking to Martha Wells, who is also part of the National Book Festival. Um, so hope to see you at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard again tomorrow evening from PBS Books. We'd like to say thank you for joining us and see you tomorrow evening. Good night.